Dr. Watts, thank you once again for joining me. How are you thank doing? Thank you. Very good. Awesome. Um, so last time uh, in our dialogues, we discussed um, two topics that are actually going to converge in this one individual. We discussed um, what quote unquote we would call the pagan generation, um, the final pagan generation, and uh, the concepts of paideia, which was a social bond, a social glue that held these things together and what was expected of somebody. Uh, so the figure that we're talking about today, um, Hypatia, um, she comes a little bit after um, this period of time, but she really inherits and lives um, and passes in the world left by the final pagan generation. So before we get into the person herself, can uh, in our discussion of Paideia, we focused a lot on Athens, but um, can we focus on Alexandria? Because I know you touched on both of them, but we only had time to discuss one. So uh, what is the world of Alexandria at this time that Hypatia is born into? Yeah, so uh, in a way, um, if we were to think about the educational world of the, the Mediterranean, um, you could maybe call Athens Oxford, and you could call Alexandria Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, it's the the newcomer in a way. Um, it was a city, of course, founded by Alexander the Great in the fourth century BC. But the uh, educational culture and the intellectual culture there was something that was kind of astroturfed by the first king of Egypt after the breakup of Alexander's empire. Uh, he put a bunch of money into building the greatest library in the Mediterranean and a bunch of money into building a set of research institutions that attracted the best scholars across the Mediterranean. And so the Alexandrian educational environment was something that was really designed from the top down to appeal to the cultural needs of a very large city. Um, and so Athens was by late antiquity, a small city, maybe 15, 20,000 people in it. Alexandria was the second biggest city in the Mediterranean. Um, it was 500,000 people, perhaps, uh, and it had been a large city for a very long time. So by the time Hypatia was born, around 355, the city of Alexandria um, was the second largest city in, in the Roman Empire for you know almost 400 years. Um, it had an infrastructure that was uh, an intellectual infrastructure first built by the Ptolemaic kings, but also later superintended by Roman emperors. Um, and it was a big city and a dynamic and vibrant city. So it was a city that uh, was the only port in the entire Mediterranean that was on one side, on the south side, a freshwater port that connected to the Nile, and on the north side, a Mediterranean port. Um, and so there, there was a saying that Alexandria was the only place in the Mediterranean where you could buy both freshwater and saltwater fish because you know you just have to walk seven miles across this sort of um, sandstone isthmus uh, to go between the two of them, or limestone isthmus, to go between the, the um, freshwater and saltwater. Uh, but because of this, all of the, pro the produce of Egypt would go be offloaded on the south side of Alexandria, trucked across the city and sent on um, across the Mediterranean. The same was true of trade coming from the Indian Ocean. It really was a world-class metropolitan area. Um, and so when Hypatia was born, this was a city that had probably the biggest in terms of numbers and maybe even in terms of percentage Christian population among the major cities in the Mediterranean. Um, it was still early in her childhood imagined to be a pagan majority city, but it probably wasn't. And it became clear in 360 around 360 that um, actually the Christians were at least as numerous as the pagans and they also could win in a fight. Uh, and so it was the first city that reaches this tipping point where pagans realize we're a minority now. Um, you know, this city is not our city. It, it belongs to these other people who have very different ideas about how religious practice works. Uh, and we need to figure out how to make that something that we can tolerate. And so Alexandria is perhaps a generation ahead of the rest of the Roman world in coming to terms with the fact that this is going to become a Christian world. Um, and for Alexandrians like Hypatia, 
this is their life. You know, they need to figure this out uh, and they need to do it in a way that causes as little disruption as possible. And Hypatia was very committed to this idea of living in a city that um, is changing dramatically. It's a dynamic city. It's a young city because a lot of the people coming into Alexandria, are, they tend to be young people um, coming into work. And so demographically, it is a city that is very, very dynamic in the fourth century. Um, and Hypatia is uh, among a group of people that are very interested in being sure that the structures that make the city work can be adaptable enough that this dynamism doesn't um, really throw the place into chaos. Fascinating. Thank you for that answer. Um, yeah, and uh, Alexandria, like uh, most cosmopolitan uh, places, um, the experience of one person versus another can drastically differ uh, depending on social, social and economic class. Um, you know, whether you're a uh, Jewish, Roman, um, a pagan, Greek speaking elite versus a demotic uh, indigenous person, right? So um, she's born into this kind of inequality, uh, for lack of a better term, that, you know, you see happens in any major city like I live in. A, where you live, you can go from uh, from the barrio to, you know, the million dollar homes on the hill or whatever. So uh, same thing for Hypatia there too. So, um, so she's inheriting a very dynamic uh, world that's bustling with culture, but also with uh, uh, perhaps uh, not always the best kind of <laughs> situation for everybody involved. Um, so Hypatia uh, becomes kind of a symbol um, after her passing. Uh, we'll talk about the symbol later, but um, like you emphasized in your biography of her, um, Hypatia is a person first. So who is that person? Who is Hypatia? What was her educational background like? Um, I want to get to know the person uh, before we touch on what she came to uh, represent for vastly different types of people. Yeah, this is why Hypatia I think is so fascinating because the the person has been lost historically. People don't want to talk about the person unless you're talking about the symbol, but the person is fascinating. Um, so she was the daughter of the most prominent scholar of uh, mathematician, scholar and mathematician in Alexandria at that time. And the daughter of an intellectual in the fourth century generally was educated uh, at a pretty high level. So they, needed to know how to write, obviously. They needed to know um, literary references and the, the sorts of things that equipped you to participate in a world of, of Paideia. Um, and they needed to also have enough background in composition uh, and rhetorical performance that they could take on an advocacy role if they needed to. Um, and we know of a lot of women in the fourth and fifth centuries who are capable of doing this and actually do perform this kind of public advocacy role, but it's usually an advocacy role that they perform on behalf of their families. Um, so they will go and make appeals for their children to be treated well. They will go and uh, make appeals for, you know, for other members of their family or their community to be treated well, but they tend not to have a public role. Um, what is different about Hypatia is she gets this training and it becomes really, really clear that she's you know, better than her father, um, far better than her father. Uh, Alexandria in that particular moment um, had embraced a brand of philosophical teaching that privileged mathematics over philosophy. Uh, this seems all very weird to us, but to an ancient audience, philosophy represented the pinnacle of all knowledge. And so you would learn things so that you could progress to that pinnacle. Uh, and the question was, what is the highest point in that knowledge? What is the highest point of you know, a human's ability to understand the dynamics of, of his or her world? Uh, and for Alexandria in the fourth century, they said that the, the, the highest point you can reach is a understanding of pure numbers. And so um, when we think of things like the concept of justice, we tend to use things like the idea that Plato develops of the forms, a kind of absolute understanding of like what justice is. Um, for an Alexandrian mathematician in the fourth century, an Alexandrian philosopher in the fourth century, they would equate that actually with a number. You know, they would say that, you know, um, you can see in this particular number, the purest manifestation of this idea. 
And so the forms are imperfect because they're vague, they're abstract. Like what is a form? Um, the number five, you can understand the number five, right? It's tangible. And so therefore there's a perfection in that tangibility. What Hypatia was able to do was overturn like a century of Alexandrian consensus that you put numbers above concepts. Um, you equate numbers with concepts, but the concepts can best be understood through numbers. Hypatia said that's not right. Actually, mathematics is very important, but it's secondary to the Platonic idea of the forms. Um, there is a higher level knowledge that comes through an understanding of the forms. Uh, and my father and his teachers and you know the past few generations of Alexandrians have done it wrong. The thing that's so remarkable about this is Hypatia makes this argument while her father is still alive. You know, she is trained in his school. Um, she does the equivalent of a dissertation uh, on a mathematical topic. And he then steps aside and gives her control of the school and she redirects Alexandrian philosophical training so that it's now about platonic ideas and not about numbers. Um, and she, has, she succeeds in doing this by the time she's in her thirties. And so we have to understand this is a figure who is brilliant, incredibly talented, um, and incredibly capable of explaining her insights and making cases that overturn literally a century of kind of received wisdom of how one understands intellectual culture in one of the two most important centers of intellectual culture in the Mediterranean world. Um, and she does it while she's young. Uh, and so we have to see in her a really, really incredibly powerful intellect um, and a really, really incredibly powerful personality. Um, and, you know, and we haven't even mentioned the fact that she does all of this, despite the fact that as a woman, she's not supposed to run her own school. Um, Absolutely. She's uh, she's uh, we as when she becomes uh, a symbol of something more, we kind of lose side of the fact that just taking Hypatia on her own terms as a person is just extraordinary. This is, this is a person who, as a woman in antiquity, um, in the Eastern um, part of the empire is uh, overcoming obstacles in a male dominated situation um, for centuries, for millennia, right? Um, she is, uh, she's writing, I mean, this isn't like, I mean, not, nothing against Cornutus, I love my Cornutus, but, you know, Cornutus is making little uh, commentaries on Aristotle and things, but Hypatia is writing commentaries on complex mathematical texts that are just completely, you know, out of, probably out of most people's pay range at that time. So oh, it's, it's her, out of my pay range. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's, uh, all great, it's all great to me, but, you know, like, and her dad is, is using her texts. Yeah. in his own writings it's just amazing just how what she accomplished and you're saying all this before she was even turning 30 and as a woman you know it's just um it's really really um amazing when you take this person on her own terms just as, as a I, person i think the gender aspect of what ipatia accomplishes is is so important because we do have other women who are teachers um but they're but they don't quite achieve what hypatia does so there is a, a woman named Pandrosion who uh, is an alexandrian mathematician who is teaching you know generation actually two generations before hypatia and she does have students um but the male establishments in alexandria attacks her so viciously i mean we actually know about her because there is a text written by somebody else that attacks her method of of um solving mathematical problems it turns out her method is better than his method. It's, it's actually wildly better. Um, but the attack is so significant because she is an outsider and she cannot be anything but an outsider. It doesn't matter how good her work is. As a woman who's a mathematician in Alexandria, she's not going to be accepted by the establishment. And so seeing the case of Pendrosion and seeing what Hypatia is able to do, where she not only is accepted by the establishment, but she revolutionizes the establishment. Um, she gets them to completely change what they understand to be the appropriate way to do philosophy and mathematics. That's breathtaking. Um, you know, there, it's not just that she was teaching. It's not just that she was running her own school. It's that she was running her own school and was so impactful that she changed the entire direction of 
you know, Harvard of antiquity. Um, it's remarkable. Uh, and, you know, and the, the sorts of obstacles that were stacked up to prevent her from doing that, that she overcame, I think are really formidable. I mean, there's nobody like her in antiquity. Well said, well said. Um, so you write in your biography of Hypatia that uh, a late antique philosopher was not primarily measured by her command of the details contained within the canonical text. People instead evaluated the degree to which her life and conduct embodied the philosophical principles those texts taught. Um, this is something that I remember from um, further uh, kind of adjacent, but uh, Garth Fowden's text about the pagan holy man in antiquity, which is basically just the teacher, you know, um, he, he was saying the same thing, whether it be Iamblichus or um, the later figures, you know, they're, the ex uh, they're almost being created as Neoplatonic saints. So where does Hypatia fit into that? Um, just in terms of herself, um, you know, we, uh, we see it in the lives of Edwards, right? Uh, Neoplatonic saints, uh, Porphyry, Proclus, um, and you know, and it's all over Eunapius, right? So, um, where does Hypatia fit into this? So, I think you know, this is, um, in a way, Pierre Hadot's idea that the philosophical life is a practical life. Um, you know, you can read these things, you can understand these things, but that doesn't make you a philosopher. The philosopher is somebody who lives these things. Um, there's a, a great passage in Eunapius or in um, Damasius's Life of Isidore, where he he says that um, a philosopher named Ammonius was the greatest commentator who ever lived. But he also makes it completely clear that he doesn't live it. You know, he doesn't live philosophy. He understands it. He writes it. His insights into the text are unparalleled. But he doesn't live like a philosopher, and therefore he's not a philosopher. And so the purpose of a philosopher was both to understand the texts and understand the systems that allow you to get at the deeper knowledge of the text, but then to apply them, you know, and apply them in a way where you lived your daily life in a way that embodied those true philosophical principles. Because in the end, philosophy was not just about getting knowledge. It was about gaining um, access to something that was more real uh, and more holy and more divine. Um, and what I, what the philosophical life was supposed to lead to was a higher level of ex ex a higher level of existing um, in this world, but also a higher level of existing beyond the sort of physical and bodily plane. And so, what Hypatia was doing um, was, first of all, realizing, even though she was trained in this way by Theon, that didn't emphasize philosophy in the same fashion she realized that philosophy did have this potential to lead to a higher level um, existence in this world and also lead to a connection with the divine. And her teaching was about um, training students so they too could live this particular type of lifestyle. Uh, and she personally believed that philosophy meant practicing, I mean, literally practicing what you're preaching, right? You, if you're gonna teach these things, you need to live these things. But it isn't just about not being a hypocrite. It's about truly getting the, the absolute benefits from um, living a way that is true and honest and, in, and is consistent with what the gods wish of you. Uh, and so this is what Hypatia is, is doing. You know, she is embodying in her conduct the ideas that she presents in her classrooms. Um, and her students absolutely understand that's what she's doing, absolutely respect it. And they really try to emulate her because they see in this um, a path to a, a higher level existence. And it's an open path. Um, and it's a path that involves contemplation. Um, and it involves understanding. And it involves knowledge. Um, and this makes it very, very appealing to people in Alexandria who particularly want to follow that kind of a contemplative path towards enlightenment. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that answer. Uh, it kind of, um, I'm not really sure, is, is Neo, is the, the kind of uh, Yamblichian Neoplatonism still in vogue at this time? Is this so still that kind this, of period? Uh, the story of Yamblichian Neoplatonism after Julian is, is a little bit, um, it kind of 
nearly dies. Uh, you know, it, it is something that um, the people, the main practitioners of it in the 350s and 360s sort of fade away uh, and it's sort of fading out. Uh, and it gets um, revivified in Athens because a, a person connected with Iamblichus, who is named Iamblichus, but is you know only connected with Iamblichus, uh, comes to Athens and introduces a couple of Athenians to this this style of teaching. And it, it takes root in Athens, and then there's an Iamblichian Neoplatonic revival that is sort of catalyzed by this um, colonization in Athens in the 390s. Hypatia is a different tradition. So there That's are true. Iamblichan Neoplatonists in Alexandria. Um, we first see them around the 390s. Um, and they have a very, very different approach to what philosophy is and what kind of public role philosophers should play than Hypatia has. So Hypatia actually is a, a devotee of the tradition that is much more associated with Porphyry and Plotinus, um, a contemplative rather than a ritual influenced or ritual inflected um, tradition. And so for Hypatia and her disciples, uh, ascent to communion with the divine comes through contemplation and it comes through thought and it comes through a kind of meditation about higher principles. Whereas for Iamblichans, um, there's a ritual aspect to it. Um, right, the theoretical aspect. Right. And if you are a Christian, the ritual aspect is a problem because it's sacrifice. Um, if you are a Christian, the contemplative approach doesn't need to be a problem, right? Because what you're doing is you're ascending to a supreme deity. And so what Hypatia's tradition is able to do is appeal equally to Christians and non-Christians. Um, you can be completely consistent with what Porphyry is saying and with the practices that um, Platinian and Porphyrian Platonism are encouraging it, and be a pagan. And you can also be completely consistent with it and be a Christian. Um, and right. there's even Origen, sort of aspects. for example, who does that, right? So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, it, and so Origen, for example, is probably, I mean, I think, um, some people disagree with me, but I think Origen was a student of the same teacher as Plotinus. You know, I think they were in the same, they were both studying under Ammonius Sakas. Oh, so you uh, fall so, to that camp where they're both studying out under Ammonius. I do, right? yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's interesting because I know some people are like, well, maybe it was a different origin. But, you know, I think I don't there's know how, two origins. Yeah, there um, are two that origins are, but... that are associated there. Um, and I think that what you know that teaching is something that can work with Christianity. And so when you read the hymns of Cynesius, um, who is Hypatia's most famous student, some of those hymns, you know, could have been written by Porphyry. Some of those hymns absolutely could not have been written by Porphyry. They are very clearly Christian. But philosophically, they don't contradict each other, right? I mean, the principles, the philosophical principles in there don't need to draw a line between the hymns that are explicitly Christian and the hymns that are not. And so for, for years, people read it as, well, Synesius converts to Christianity in the middle. I don't think so. You know, the system works. Hypatia's system works for both sets of hymns. Um, and so I think that what Hypatia realizes is she is in a way a convert to this way of approaching philosophy. Um, she realizes that there is a tremendous appeal to this way of approaching philosophy in a city that religiously is going through tremendous turmoil. Uh, because this is a way to embody the promise of Paideia, to bring together everybody who is educated, Christian, pagan, doesn't matter. Um, but to do it, not just about rhetoric and you know, performance of traditional, um, traditional Greek public speaking, but to do it through philosophy. And there's a way for philosophy too, to continue to serve as this high level sort of capstone of knowledge and education um, and not make it fall victim to the confessional politics and the division that the uh, conversion of the empire to Christianity is creating. And so what Hypatia has is a vision for philosophy as something that is 100% true to her convictions of what platonic interpretation leads to, and also completely accessible regardless of the religious tradition that you belong to. And this is what she's teaching. She's teaching Christians, she's teaching pagans, she's teaching them in the same sort of contemplative influence system. The only thing she's not doing is saying what that supreme God is. 
And as long as you don't say what that supreme <laughs> God is, it can be Christian, it can be the Platonic, it can be the Platinian one, it can be whatever you see it as, but there's a supreme God at the center of this system. And Hypatia's philosophy is something that allows you to understand that God's knowledge that has been conveyed to humans and helps you sort of commune with a higher level reality that is closer to that God. And if that's a Christian God, good for you. And if it's not a Christian God, good for you. The tradition works and you can be part of this family and this tradition um, without asking or answering that one question. And as long as you don't answer that question or ask that question, this is a training that works for Christians and pagans. Theos hypsistos, right? Like, well, what kind of God is it? Oh, it's just the highest God, you know, you don't know. But um, but yeah, she really was a, a really trailblazing ecumenical figure, especially at this time of flux in, in the world. Um, you know, thank you for that clarification also on her, uh, the, you know, the difference between the Yamblichian and the uh, the Platinian concept of the com contemplation versus the theurgical ritual. I, I always found that fascinating because it was also a point of, you know, just some little side observations before I get to the next question. Just, I always found that fascinating because, uh, you know, even, even in within Neoplatonism or quote unquote Neoplatonism itself, you could tell there was a huge um, tension there between, yeah. you know, Yamblichus is on the mysteries is all about, you know, how uh, poor, perhaps Plotinus doesn't have it all right. And uh, I always found the Porphyrian contemplative uh, part interesting as well, because you you don't need to theorize about it in terms of like, oh, this could, you know, just as well be this as, as that. You see it in Nag Hammadi. Like Porphyry yeah. or uh, later Porphyry is using the same kind of florilegium uh, that became the sentences of Sextus and Nag Hammadi. You know, they're both drawn from the same traditions and they're both just kind of uh feeding off of each other and they, they're equally working as well so um perhaps another another time on that though <laughs> but uh uh yeah so spoiler alert for our audience Hypatia does pass in the sense, senseless act of mob violence in march 415. um so dr watts what were some of the factors um that brought this all to a head especially if you could touch upon the uh, tensions between orestes and cyril yeah uh so the the problem that we have in um alexandria as you get into the four tens is uh, there had been an eruption of violence between the amblican neoplatonists and christian authorities in the in the early like in 392 um, where Neoplatonists were, uh, in a sense, they were provoked by actions of the bishop. There was a riot uh, and they seized and fortified the Serapeum Temple, which was on a the highest point in Alexandria and very, very difficult to access. And so there was a standoff um, that was resolved by the students of the Iamblichan um, Neoplatonic group agreeing to leave the Serapeum. They were they were given amnesty for the violence they committed and they killed people. I mean, they killed a significant number of people. Um, they were given amnesty, the teachers fled Alexandria and then Christians stormed the Serapeum and tore the temple down. And Hypatia was instrumental in bringing the city back. I mean, there was a, a working relationship that was developed between Hypatia and the bishop in Alexandria. Hypatia, of course, was not any applicant. Um, there's no indication that her students were involved in this. She certainly was not involved in this kind of thing. Um, and so she represented a, a establishment that was looking to build back some kind of consensus about how Alexandria should work and what sorts of people should be um, running the city. And Theophilus, who was the bishop, who had in a way proved his point, um, also was looking for some sort of way to, to calm the city down uh, and make it governable. And so this prevailed for about 20 years uh, until Theophilus' death. Um, but when Theophilus died, he had been preparing things so that his nephew, Cyril, could take over for him. Um, but the illness that Theophilus had, it seems like he probably had a stroke. Uh, and so he was incapacitated, but he didn't die. Uh, so Cyril couldn't make any moves to officially take over control of the Alexandrian church because Theophilus was still alive. Um, but it gave rivals enough time to build a power base to try to challenge Cyril. And when Theophilus finally finally died, there was um, a pretty intense, though short-lived, outburst of street fighting in the city. 
um, that lasted long enough for certain communities to line up either for or against Cyril. And once that ended and Cyril became Bishop of Alexandria, uh, he began settling scores. Um, and this led to a conflict with the, um, the governor in charge of Alexandria, who was a man named Orestes. Um, Orestes tried to sideline Cyril by working with the city council, and in particular, working with Hypatia. Uh, and the bet that Orestes was making um, was that Hypatia is a philosopher. Hypatia is a woman. Hypatia has no, um, there's no way Hypatia can hold office in the city, although she does work with the city council and she serves as a uh, emissary and expresses concerns on behalf of the city. She's never going to hold office in the city. She's never going to hold office in the empire. Um, instead, she is seen as an honest broker who behaves publicly in a way that's totally consistent with her philosophical principles. And so there's a certain power there that, um, that comes with this status as a philosophically influ inf influenced, um, philosophically informed speaker of principle. And so when Orestes is trying to negotiate some kind of a solution to the problem that Cyril is posing, this, this problem of um, disruption and, and regular violence in the city, he starts working with Hypatia to build a coalition of people who are anti-Cyril. Um, and Hypatia serves as a liaison linking the city council to Orestes. Uh, and she becomes seen by supporters of Cyril as um, the locus of resistance to Cyril. Um, and so supporters of Cyril attack her uh, when she's out in public. And Hypatia had a tendency to travel in public and, and go in public without a lot of attendance. Uh, most people in, in, in a Roman city, if you are wealthy and well off, um, I think we can imagine kind of like how Cersei Lannister travels in King's Landing and Game of Thrones. You know, you don't want to actually set foot on the ground. <laughs> you don't want to be kind of unex like out there exposed. You want to be carried or protected and have lots of attendants around you. Hypatia wasn't like that. Hypatia just traveled in the city, even though she was elite, even though she was important, even though she was prominent and well known. Um, she just traveled in the city by herself and she was set upon by a mob um, as she was walking home and they tore her apart. I mean, literally tore her apart. Um, we're told that uh, they used roof tiles to cut her body to pieces, and then they burned her body alongside the seashore at the site near to um, the Cathedral of Alexandria. And this horrified people. Um, it horrified everybody in Alexandria because Hypatia represented the kind of embodiment of honesty and principle in public life. She didn't do these things because she wanted to gain anything from doing them. She did these things because her practice as a philosopher obligated her to be publicly involved. Um, it was the obligation of every philosopher who took the position seriously to do what they could to make the society around them more philosophical. And that meant they had to play a public role. And some of that was teaching, but some of that was also standing up before their fellow citizens and saying, you know, what you're doing is it's inconsistent with a higher level principle or what you're doing is unjust or what you're doing is unfair um, and what you're doing is unwise. And they are supposed to speak from their sense of how the larger principles of the world fit together and give you a sense of how the smaller things that you are focused on fit into a bigger picture that's influenced by, by the divine and influenced by um, knowledge and influenced by the kind of higher principles um, that only a philosopher can really understand. And that's what Hypatia was doing. And so what philosophers were supposed to do. Uh, and she was killed for it. And not only was she doing that, but unlike some other philosophers like Themistius um, and some other contemporary philosophers in the fourth and, and early fifth century, she wasn't pretending to be a philosopher for her own gain. She wasn't getting rich from this. She wasn't becoming important from this. She didn't intend to get any like government offices. She couldn't, she couldn't get any of those things. She was doing this because it was her job. It was her obligation. Um, it was her passion. It was her way of life and they killed her for it. And so this becomes symbolic of a general social breakdown where um, nobody was sure what rules are now governing things. Um, and so it's a tremendously disruptive thing for people in Alexandria 
um, to see that somebody like Hypatia could be killed. You know, they understood partisans in a religious conflict. They understood that maybe, you know, um, monks or people who worked for the bishop might fight other monks or people who worked for the bishop. They might fight militant pagans, um, but they didn't fight people who were non-combatants. Uh, and so when Hypatia was killed, it really emphasized to people uh, that something was dramatically out of line. Um, and probably the thing that emphasizes that best is there's a historian named Socrates Scholasticus who writes a church history. And the principle that's guiding his church history is uh, the idea that whatever, um, when the church is healthy, the empire and the, the world is healthy. And when the church is too concerned with material gain or political power, then the Roman world gets kind of thrown off its axis and there are all these problems. And the evidence that he uses to show that the Roman world was falling off its axis in the 410s is a set of events, um, one of which is the sack of Rome by Alaric, something that everybody who does Roman history knows about. That's less important in Socrates' mind than the murder of Hypatia. The murder of Hypatia is better evidence that the world is messed up than the fact that Rome was sacked for the first time in 800 years. And so that shows how shocking it was um, that she was killed in this particular way. Right. This is probably the point, like, like you mentioned in your book, um, very quickly, um, Hypatia becomes a symbol. And we're going to get into the symbol right now, but you, you write a quote, um, Hypatia's death was so shocking, so frightening, that she quickly became a symbol of an older, more functional time that seemed to be slipping away in the early 5th century. And you mentioned the sack of Rome, um, the general instability of the empire. Um, for more on that, go to Dr. Watts's channel. Uh, it's amazing. Um, uh, but more on that at the end. Um, so yeah, we'll get into the symbolism right now. Um, Hypatia seems to, after she becomes a cipher for um, vastly different people, um, this kind of tends to lead to her being a very misunderstood figure in general. Um, she's incredibly important, um, but people tend to just imprint their own ideas um, and identity onto her most for the most part. Uh, this is something you really focus on in the last couple of chapters of your book. Um, so going from Scholasticus to uh, today with Hypatia as a feminist symbol or as a um, any of the other kind of symbols people want to appropriate her for, you know, pagan identity, anything like that. Um, can you elaborate on, um, you know, just Hypatia as a symbol and uh, are people necessarily getting her right? Uh, yeah, I think that the thing that we get is this one image of Hypatia, this philosophical woman being torn to pieces. And then that, over time can mean anything that people want it to mean. So Hypatia becomes a symbol of, um, in the fifth century, to many people, Hypatia becomes a symbol of a society that doesn't value rules anymore. Um, it doesn't value the things that govern behavior. It doesn't value uh, the protections that people could expect to have. And so when fifth century author authors are talking about Hypatia, they just say enough about her to set up that she belongs to a kind of society that valued rules and certain behaviors. And that society was torn apart when she was killed. Um, by the time you get into the sixth century, uh, she becomes much more um, something that pagans want to talk about. So pagans talk about Hypatia's murder uh, in the early sixth century in the context of Justinian's actions against paganism. Um, and she becomes this a sort of symbol of Christian intolerance more broadly. Um, not like Socrates is a Christian. Socrates believes that the empire should be Christian. He just believes that it shouldn't be Christian in the way that it happened in Alexandria, where you're murdering people who are basically innocent non-combatants just doing their job. Um, in the sixth century, pagans say that this is a symbol of, you know, Christianity's natural violence and the way that it overturns social norms. Um, by the seventh century, you see this as a uh, way of emphasizing the distinctiveness of a certain brand of Christianity in Egypt. Uh, and Hypatia becomes the villain in the story as it's told in the seventh century, um, where Cyril is a hero and he's working with governor, or he's working 
um, to try to make the church viable. And governors work with the evil magician Hypatia to prevent Cyril from doing what he needs to do. Um, that's a seventh century perspective that in some ways is shaped by, you know, the fact that the author has lived through persecution of the Egyptian church um, and is also actually writing under um, the first sort of beginnings of um, anti-Christian activity by Muslim rulers in, in Egypt. So you have a perspective there that, again, is a perspective that influ that, that filters a seventh century reality into the story of Hypatia. Um, as you move through time, you see like a 17th century reality filtered through Hypatia. You see in France, uh, in the early 18th century, you see a biography of Hypatia that's written at the behest of a woman who wants people to take seriously the idea of women as scholars. Um, what's interesting about that text is the person who writes it does not give this, this um, woman the text that she wants. And so it's published in this literary journal um, in the 1710s. And the next issue has a letter from the woman that is a kind of um, passive aggressive shade throwing on the person who wrote the article uh, or the biography saying, well, actually that isn't what I wanted him to write. And really what we should see in Hypatia is a legendary woman who stands for what women can accomplish. And instead he wrote something that was like a, a Christian polemic. Um, by the time you get into the 19th century, uh, some of the stories about Hypatia that are told are colonialist stories about um, Greek sort of European uh, culture in an environment that is orientalized um, and violent. Uh, and so you have the reflection of, of colonialism in the way that Hypatia is presented. Um, a totally ahistorical understanding of what Hypatia was, but Charles Kingsley was not interested in history. He was interested in a particularly racist and noxious Victorian way of seeing the other. Um, and he uses the story to, to tell that. Uh, in the 20th century, you, you get Hypatia as a symbol of feminism. Um, and in some ways, the some of the portraits of Hypatia as a feminist icon are things that Hypatia herself would have been appalled by. Um, there's one that talks about her as a sexually liberated um, woman who, you know, who chose her own sexual destiny. And uh, Hypatia was a virgin, very proudly so. <laughs> um, yeah, that so, is completely so Cine, right? Like that was a very big thing among those philosophers back then. Yeah, there's yeah, actually a story really that over. I think originates from Hypatia herself that says that there was a student who um, fell in love with her. And she tries to convince him that this is just a bodily thing. She tries to actually use, it's, it said she's, she uses a therapy that Pythagoras develops that um, uses music to calm the passions of somebody. And she tries it and the student is too far gone for this to work. And so she takes a menstrual pad and, and shows it to him and says, this is what you're in love with, to emphasize to him that his, uh, his attraction to her is bodily. And the emotional attraction that a philosopher has exists on the level of the soul, it has nothing to do with the body. And he needs to snap back into that because that kind of love is something that, that her circle embodies. Physical love is not something that has any part in it. So seeing Hypatia as an embodiment of sexual liberation, that's not who Hypatia was. Um, but it's, it's a way of understanding Hypatia uh, that reflects a particular 20th century set of concerns. Um, and so what we see with Hypatia, and even now, I think the, the example probably people are most familiar with is the movie Agora, where you have Hypatia presented as like this um, person who discovers, what is it, like a Copernican universe uh, yeah, I thought before that was Copernicus, <laughs> and then is attacked by a group of people who look, a group of Christian monks who look a lot like the Taliban. Um, and so you have a 21st century view of Hypatia as, you know, like a, a STEM person, when you know actually she does the opposite and moves you away from STEM to higher level principles of philosophy, um, attacked by you know a movement that is very very clearly dressed up in noticeably 21st century um, garb. So you see in each moment um, just the simple fact that you have with Hypatia a person who died um, and had this status as a philosopher. You see her reinterpreted based on the ideals, conditions, and tensions of whatever moment um, she needs to be reinterpreted, whatever moment, whatever conflict she's being introduced into. Um, but when that happens, you lose the person. And when you focus on her death, 
you lose the life and you lose the uh, agency and you lose the the power and achievement and bravery of this this woman. Um, and I think that what I was hoping to do in the book is to show that when we tell these stories, we're keeping the name of Hypatia alive, but we're not keeping the legacy of Hypatia alive. You know, the, the legacy of something that should belong to her. It shouldn't belong to the people who killed her. And so the story of Hypatia has to really focus on what she had control over. Um, and the fact that for like 60 years, she had control over quite a bit and she achieved quite a bit that was completely consistent with what her objectives were. We should not focus on the last minutes of her life when she didn't have control over what was going on. Um, and to do anything but that is to not do justice to this person who's a remarkable person who um, very much deserves our attention and our respect. Absolutely, well said. Um, and just a side observation before we go here. Yeah, in a sense, she reminds me of another um, Alexandrian figure, Philo. Um, people really take Philo and they lose sight of the person um, and they use him for a vast multitude of things. Uh, they don't really take Philo on his own terms. Uh, I think David Runia and uh, I read a, bi a biography of Philo, Philo, an intellectual thinker in the Jewish diaspora by Haras Liddell, but she, they both mentioned, you know, just <laughs> let Philo be Philo. Let's, yeah. and, and the same here, let, let Hypatia be Hypatia. They're both far more fascinating than any other imprints we kind of um, cast, the shadows we cast on them. Right. Um, but Dr. Watts, this has uh, been incredible. Thank you for uh, giving us this uh, portrait of this remarkable human being. Um, I would love to do this again sometime. So sure. uh, perhaps I'll have you back um, shortly. Um, in the meantime though, um, I know you have an awesome YouTube channel, which I watch quite a bit. So, uh, where can people find that? Where can people find your book on Hypatia? Uh, so the Hypatia book comes from Oxford University Press. You can get it from Oxford University Press. It's also on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and um, probably wherever you look for books. Uh, and then the YouTube channel is The Eternal Decline of Rome. Um, and that has a whole bunch of things about Roman history and people and uh, events associated with Roman history. Um, and I think we're we're starting up something on um, Roman sites and, and probably Roman coins. So those should be appearing hopefully in the near future. So check out, right. check that out for sure. I think you released one of them already, haven't you? Um, yeah, yeah. We're, we're trying to do um, a discussion of Roman sites that people might not know about but are really fascinating to look at. And then we're going to do some shorts on Roman coins, which is a, a passion of mine, so. Awesome, awesome. And in the meantime, Dr. Watts, this has been absolutely a pleasure. Thank you so much for being generous with your time and your knowledge. You Thank you so awesome. much.